Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best founders and investors to help you scale a business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest is Tony, the CEO of Growblox. Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks. It is a pleasure, and it is always a responsibility to host a peer uh, who also has his own podcast. So <laughs> thanks for <laughs> for the extra the extra pressure. But uh, yeah, you have an amazing um, background and a great story. Uh, you have been a revenue leader who achieved two exits before, based in in Copenhagen. And, and now you are leading your own VC packet company. Uh, so that's a great transition from uh, CRO, Chief Revenue Officer, to CEO, Chief Executive Officer. But for the ones who didn't have the pleasure to get to meet you yet, uh, let us know more about your story and your background and uh, what has been the reason to start Growblocks. Sure. No, let's do that. Thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to be here and talk about it. So Pleasure. I think, um, so basically kind of for the last, 10, 11 years, I've been in B2B SaaS, um, really kind of started in one company called Falcon Social Data on Falcon and I.O. Now it's called Brandwatch. I um, was one of the first 10 folks there um, and uh, had kind of a variety of different different roles there, actually. Um, actually, in the beginning, very much revenue operations. We didn't call it like that back then, but it really mm -hmm. was revenue operations going across. Um, then I spent a couple of years in the U.S. for that business, building up the U.S. market and the U.S. office. And around that time, and I think in terms of ARR at the time, we were around 15 million ARR, I think. Um, I basically took on the, um, the, the, whole, the whole revenue stream, uh, meaning marketing, sales, CES, and revenue operations. There was a couple of you know, steps in between, you know, don't, I'm jumping over that a little bit. Uh, but in that sense, then becoming the CRO of this thing. And um, then we exited Falcon to Cision, which is like a U.S. At the, at the time, it was a U.S. public company, uh, best known uh, through PR Newswire, kind of one of their main uh, main right. brands, actually. Um, and then I spent another year with the company to do the integration and all of that stuff. Um, and basically then deciding, uh, deciding to jump to my next opportunity. And I mean, when you do this exit and all of this is great and all of this is obviously good fun and everything, but... I mean, stuff changes, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when you're part of like a large public, very much financially driven corporation in the US, culture just changes, right? And it wasn't it wasn't my thing. Um, right. So I moved on to uh, to another team here in Copenhagen called uh, Plan Day. Um, basically joined them in March 2020. So like 10 days before the pandemic. <clears throat> and, you know, what you need to know about Plan Day is that they are a scheduling software for cafes, restaurants, and hotels, like SMB stuff. So this okay. was quite a... <laughs> Good timing. It <laughs> was, was quite great timing going from a very comfy spot, uh, you know, publicly listed company, growing <laughs> decently, making good good money, jumping into this other thing. Um, luckily, I mean, we we maneuvered around. Basically, my, my role was also the same, like CRO, all marketing, sales, and CS. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we, we maneuvered around the whole thing uh, of, of the pandemic and had like some really cool successes with the vaccination places and then the testing places and so forth. So it kind of worked out in the end. Um, and we sold uh, only 18 months later. So this business was already going on for 10 years or something like that. So only wow. 18 months after I joined, we sold um, to zero. The um, the accounting software out of Australia, New Zealand, um, right. and for me, you know, while this thing was going on, and you know, I've I've seen that movie just once before, but I could already tell. I think um, you know, as time went by and the process went on, I could tell like, hey, this thing is this thing is gonna happen, right? So obviously, high five. Uh, but mm -hmm. I myself would have loved to spend a little bit more time there before this happened. Um, but I also reached the conclusion that um, probably it's not going to be the place where I want to be after the the merger was completed, right? So kind of that was already right. starting to be clear for me uh, during the process. Yeah, and then starting to think what's next, and this is then where 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 Roblox came into came into view. Great, great story, uh, and. Uh... I'm 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 super curious to to get to know more about Growblocks uh, or I mean 
I love the problem that you guys are solving to be to be more honest uh, with with the audience. Uh, and that's why I reached out to you to invite you to come to to the show because I've seen that problem again and again and again and without okay. creating even more suspense for the ones who are listening <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So I think the I think the frustration came out of um, you know, being the CRO running those organizations. Um and I basically partnered up with um, Olaf, who is co-founding at Groblox and COO of another B2B scale-up in Copenhagen, at Templify. Um, and we both have experienced the same issues all the time, which is really, um, you know, the board comes up with a growth target. Uh, obviously, the CEO sits in there as well. Um, then there's a little bit of, you know, executive leadership offside to figure out how to get to that growth target. Um, and then there's a budget that comes out of it, right? And that's... That's where most companies kind of stop, right? Um, but but the budget and the strategy um, is fairly useless in the day to day. It doesn't connect, you know, the operations down to the day to day. And if you're in revenue operations, or if you're a CRO, if you're even a CEO, um, you sometimes wonder how um, how the grand strategy then is actually being executed, right? And and we basically, with Growblox, we kind of jump right into this gap. And, and we do that by um, basically kind of two main ways. Um, st step one is to um, replicate your go-to-market engine in, in, a, in a digital format, if you will. So we're basically modeling out your go-to-market engine from traffic to churn. So the whole thing, um, we're splitting it into um, all of those different dimensions that might be important to you, your regions, your channels, your attribution, your segments, and so forth. Um, and then once we have that engine set up, um, you know, our customers are then using it to, you know, the boring part is they're using it to do bottom-up planning. So, okay, we are now at the strategy offside. We now have this financial plan. How are we actually going to hit that financial plan? How's that actually going to happen? You know, what inputs do we need to put into the engine in order to get to that revenue result? So that's the boring part, but it's super crucial. And once you have that, uh, you basically then have a, uh, you know, real-time funnel monitoring day-to-day, -day, every day, where you can basically see exactly um, where you should be in your leading indicators, where you should be obviously on your revenue. Everyone knows that. Um, and, and it basically enables you, instead of sitting there at the end of Q1 high-fiving, because everyone is hitting Q1, by the way. I hope everyone listening is hitting Q1, because everyone does, because that's kind of the, the forecastability everyone has in the budgeting cycle. Um, but what usually people are high-fiving to at the end of Q1 is actually um, to a degree flawed because most organizations at the time already missed a bunch of their uh, funnel metrics leading up to hitting Q2 and Q3, right? And and having that visibility immediately, you know, in early January, uh, seeing the issues, fixing that, and then course correcting um, basically helps companies to execute this flawlessly. So I went a little bit into a pitch here, but uh, I'm, uh, I hope I'll, I'll be forgiven. No, that that's perfect. And I think that's the, we all can resonate with the problem, uh, especially the ones who have been there several times. We have seen the movie happen yeah. again and again yeah. and again, right? And uh, and yeah, and then we see the, the snowball because uh, as you said, in a VC back at company, the expectation is clear for everyone involved. So yeah. we want at least to, depending on the stage of growth, to 2x revenue. Nowadays, we have the also the metric of net revenue retention, then yeah. the, the CAC LTV, CAC payback, and those unit yeah. economics also need to make sense. Uh, and those are kind of a given. Uh, then we need to realize how, how we make that happen. And when the snowball effect starts, uh, and we are yeah. looking to each other to say, should we correct the target or should we uh, yeah. keep the same target? What will be the story that we will tell to investors? Uh, what yeah. is the story that we will tell to team? Because maybe we can also see some people leaving to another uh, opportunity, especially when the market uh, is yep. warmer. And th that's incredible because sometimes we think it's, uh, especially I think that in these shows, we always talk about the conversation that we left with investors, but I think it's, it's multilateral, right? So, uh, what will be our conversation and our pitch to all the stakeholders? Because in the in the marvelous world, we could say just get out and say, "Look, guys, we have a problem." <laughs> yeah. But but this will also create a, a problem of of confidence uh, in the team. Are we selling the right product with the right channels? Do we yeah. have the right team? Do we have the right leaders? Uh, and yeah, those are very no, weird moments. I 
No, I think you. I think you're absolutely right. And just yesterday, kind of, uh, we recorded a, a podcast episode, and 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 one of the one of the pieces there was actually um, when you now come to this end of Q1, right, and you have a high five moment because you hit your revenue target, um, and uh, and you already know that your funnel is kind of behind. You can actually use that good moment with a board to bring in some bad news instead of you know, soft right. missing Q2, hard missing Q3, and then needing to bring, hey, Q4 is also going to be a disaster, right? Having having that expectation uh, managed from a moment of strength when you're actually are hitting the plan puts you as, as a of leader course. and a leadership team in a completely different, in a completely different spot from the, from the perspective of the board uh, compared to uh, when you're already off track for a while and then needing to, you know, then, then it's a, then it's a pretty, you know, uh, a steep hill to climb suddenly with a board, not to lose the confidence and so forth, right? Exactly. I think it's also important there sometimes, nowadays it's different because we are seeing second and first time generations um, yeah. of leaders, but at the time is what else should we deliver those kind of numbers? It seems that the CEO was crazy. Uh, why don't we just say that we will grow 10% or 20% or we'll be flat this year? <laughs> yeah. And then we need to explain what is the VC game rules and how it works and what is expected. Uh, and of course, it makes sense sometimes to, to rebuild the foundation, to treat the growth plateau and grow again. But we should mm. not just say, look, we'll not grow. And uh, that's what it is. That's the nature of the business because we are just saying we are not a right fit for yeah. uh, the VC path. And yeah. uh, this is a hard conversation to have. We, we don't that's have any very, hope in the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a very hard conversation to have. But I think, you know, so I mean, I'm, I was, you know, on the, on the outside, I mean, I was part of some board meetings and so forth, but I wasn't the one, you know, carrying the number and in terms of, you know, uh, you know, defending whether or not it's 40, 50 or hundred percent growth. I was the one delivering it in the end. Um, yeah. but, uh, now that I'm sitting in that, in that chair, kind of some things, some things have a little bit changed, obviously I gotta say. Um, but I think my realization is also, um, you know, especially, and there's a little bit of a shift in the VC landscape. I feel from like professional VCs versus, Hey, we've been a successful entrepreneur and now we're a general partner and a right. fund kind of VCs. Right. Um, and I've been um, there, I understand what what you are what you are yeah. feeling, right? But, but the so, but the I think it is both upsides and downsides, by the way. But my my point right. is actually, and my point is actually, um, what these folks are really really good at, um, is telling you how the company needs to look like, you know, at the end of your funding, you know, when your funding runs out in order to have the highest chances to acquire great additional funding and have a good, good valuation. They, they, mm -hmm. they know how it needs to look like, but what they don't have any clue about is how you're going to get there. And I think right. having that differentiation very clear, actually also on the board and kind of uh, bringing up, Hey, this is, we, we all want to optimize for that thing. You're totally right. You know, net retention of a hundred and, you know, 56 or whatever percent. Yeah. Um, but you know, operationally, how are we going to get there? Um, well, first of all, we don't know yet, depending on where you are in your kind of journey, right? Um, but second of all, maybe we can get to 110, maybe 120 and so forth. Um, and and having having that conversation and splitting it in those two, um, at least for where I am right now, uh, helped me help me quite a bit. That's, I'm sure it's yeah. gonna change going forward. And just to conclude, kind of uh, touching the problem and, and feeling the pain, <laughs> you, you can see from the ones who are listening that I, I felt this pain a lot of time, then comes the conversation. We get out of our quarterly leadership team session. I'm starting having my one-on-ones with the different members of the leadership team. And someone asks me, do you have any templates or do you know someone who can help me uh, kind of find a way to get to the numbers? Because I mm. don't want to, to tell the CEO that I that I don't, don't know how I will get there. Yeah. It seems a bit, yeah. a bit crazy. Uh, I've been talking with the CFO. It seems that the template doesn't work for me as well there. Uh, do you know any peer, anyone that you can introduce, or do you have a template that you have worked with other companies that can <laughs> help me out? And that's what I was saying. I'm so happy that finally I have uh, a solution to direct them to. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, so, because yeah, I always need to explain, yeah, 
I would love to, but I'm also not a, a revenue leader expert. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. much more a leadership team coach. I'm a generalist and a, an expert in, in scaling up. So those conversations were a little bit odd uh, to have after after those quarterly sessions. <laughs> there you go. That's everyone good. would say, let's go, let's go, let, let, let's make it happen. And uh -huh. then... Oh the hell! <laughs> how, how, how do I present this to my team? How do I plan this? How do I make this happen? And then how do I avoid start reporting it and not going in in that direction? That is even more odd. <laughs> yeah, I got it. So I mean, maybe one last point on this. I gotta say, yeah. so when we started in twenty one, so we're still super young, right? We're like one and a half years. We, I think we were lucky say, with yeah. our funding. Kind of in October twenty one, we picked up two million pre seed, and June last year we picked up another million in. Uh, another six million in seed um and this june you know this was before the market basically melted right kind of that was kind of the last we were very lucky with that i feel um now a great still, timing yeah <laughs> no i mean i would love to say that we called the market but that is not nothing to do with that um no but so when we were working with our customers back then it was basically you know we had companies at three or four million AR um that kind of stumbled to get there uh, picked up a big 15, 20, 25 million uh, Series A, Series B check. And then we're basically saying like, hey, uh, the, the unicorn table tells us we now need to be at 10, 11, 12 million by the end of this year. Yep. And we we were like, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. Let's let's go. We plucked it in. We ran the numbers. And we basically like, I, I'm not sure how you're going to get there, guys. You know, it's like we we even played around with this thing. This is the other um, side and, of the coin. The template yeah. doesn't work. Now I have yeah. the template, and but, but the this, numbers still don't work. This was, this was exactly what happened. And suddenly we got pushback from these CEOs. Just um, just get the model there. Just get it there, right? Exactly. And, you know, our, our person kind of rev ops, right? Uh, you know, they were like, uh, okay, I mean, I can get the model there. And we were, you know, one joke was uh, just tell me what number I put into the ACV assumption, then I can get every model there. There's no problem. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and basically kind of that, I feel that has shifted just a little bit. I think there's uh, now when we talk to folks and maybe, maybe, maybe it's not only the market, but also kind of those founders being a bit more educated and um, there's now, okay, so what, what realistically can we do? Then there's right. this gap. Let's talk about the gap. Let's talk about the gap in a data driven way. And let's kind of try and melt it away. Uh, but not go to crazy town, which which I think was very much the name of the game, uh, at least last year and probably the couple of years before. But you know, I haven't I haven't seen that firsthand. And I need to admit again, I'm I'm not criticizing anybody. I, I'm talking about myself. So mm -hmm. if we are not getting to the number, and if our executives are not able to give us a number, we have the wrong people on the table. So mm -hmm. let's find someone uh, who can present as the number and how we'll get there. And we know how dangerous that is because there are some people that would be okay to tell you, yes, I can reach you the number. This is the way we'll get there. And, and we know that they are not being uh, honest, truthful, uh, yeah. truthful ab about that. Uh, and, and again, nothing wrong. Sometimes we get desperate. We also need to pay yep. bills all at home. And we know how stressful and hectic it is to be in a VC packet company. The expectations mm. are really hard. And we know it's an emotional roller coaster because let's say even the most successful leaders who are able to, to X in the previous year, sometimes they are exhausted for new, the new period and they don't have a clue about how they get to the next state of reclaim. Yeah. Again, they are running and leading a very different company. So just to say out there, I've made those mistakes myself. And I've also been at the side of the CEO telling, yes, you need to make that hard decision. The good news is that I was also honest with those leaders in, the, in the, my one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, telling, mm. I think that we have a year problem and it's, this is normal. You have been very successful until now. And it's not, you have never been in this stage of growth. So it's normal that you mm -hmm. don't know. Uh, maybe we need to find out someone to help you out uh, via peers, mentors, whatever it is. And if it doesn't work, uh, you know what will be the yeah. the end result of this. But but we now we know that this is also a problem that we have across Europe. And I'm seeing a lot of CEOs, not only revenue leaders, say uh, that we have that we see those revenue leaders coming, being here for uh, six or twelve months leaving yeah. and, and we have a problem in that sense because sometimes it's not a problem of the leader it's a problem of the operating yep. system of the business model and uh, it's it's very unfair for for those revenue leaders and today 
I admit that in pu- in public in in this uh, <laughs> podcast. Apologies <laughs> for the ones. At least I've been ethical, correct with them, always honest. But I know that I've been a bit unfair after seeing the movie much more times uh, yeah. now. Uh, and and seeing that uh, and sometimes it happens that we don't have the right leaders in the table and, and we need to address those and, and take the hard Absolutely. decisions but a lot of times uh, i can recognize that that's not the problem of the leader that that's another problem that we have no i think and you know you you decide when you want to take it to the next topic but the it, sorry I think about, the... Uh, we are really pressing here on, on, the, on yeah. the problem <laughs> <laughs> that grow blocks is the... something at the end that we expect at least to have a lunch or or a yes. dinner sometime there you go <laughs> um no so so actually kind of how i would recommend actually solving some of that stuff obviously you know using some kind of a model whether or not that's in a piece of software an excel spreadsheet you figure this out um but try and try not use the uh, top-down approach from finance where basically hey 10 million and then we need to break it down how many new customers and how many new opportunities and how many new mkls uh because you can and i've been there myself you can kind of sit with those numbers and rationalize uh, rationalize yourself into those numbers being okay, right? And then you start like, oh, we're still not quite hitting. Let's tune those conversion rates of the SUVs just a little bit. Um, I would advise to do it the other way around, actually. Um, start from, uh, okay, what can we do when? You know, that might be hiring, that might be campaigns, that might be improvement projects. Um, and how much output will those things actually generate? Um, and you can still leave yourself some leeway in the second half of the year where you might have new ideas to kind of get new boosts from. Um, but start with that approach. And usually uh, that thing will be a little bit more uh, close to the truth at the end of the year than whatever the reverse engineering from finance kind of comes up with, right? Kind of do a, a bottom up basically. Um, and then you have like at least two goalposts and then you can start having the conversation. And, and then it's not just the... Um, you know, it goes away from this. You as a revenue leader are just trying to, uh, you know, negotiate down the number. You know, you're just trying to have an easier target. Right. <laughs> um, and it becomes more of a, well, you know, this is what we think we can do um, versus, hey, this is what we want to do, right? Um, but let's yeah. let's leave it at that, maybe. Yeah. And uh, I have seen the impact that those conversations have in the team, not only the revenue leader himself but even in the peers that feel Mm -hmm. a little bit stressed out and emotionally freaking up so this is really serious for for the ones who have been in those rooms because sometimes especially the ones who are listening to the show that are in another levels of the organization might say well this is kind of the paradise they are just deciding and making our decisions and getting out no they are really stressful sometimes getting there, trying to find out the solution and trying to make everything that is possible to make the numbers work (laughs) No, I mean, this is like a, if you're in product market fit, this sounds like a paradise problem, right? So it's basically kind of where we are right now. We're still product market fit stage, right? Um, mm-hmm. But as soon as you hit, you go to market fit, uh, you know, working on that, um, yeah. let's just say around two, three million or something, and then wanting to triple that, I think right. I think the problem will will yes. become more clear in everyone's minds. Because then it's not only about the vision, the metrics yeah. uh, need to work and you are reporting on the metrics, not in the promise of the future. Yeah. But let's yeah. go to who are uh, your ideal customer profile and uh, what is the, the kind of company that that you guys are supporting with this problem? So um, we ideally, um, so currently the current focus, right? And it is shifting and it's moving and we're getting more mature yeah. on this. But our current focus is uh, tech companies um, between five and fifty million AR. You know that that's really much the focus. Um, if you have uh, like an SMB motion or a mid market motion, I think around uh, uh, five million is great. If you have enterprise tickets uh, like fifty, hundred k, hundred fifty k, maybe it, you know because of sample size issues, maybe it makes more sense to kind of engage around ten million. Kind of that's that's kind of how we're breaking down the world. Um, and besides that, we don't have many limitations, actually, right? We, we, we're not limited in terms of your tax stack or something else or the uh, the way you see in the world or the funnel or something like that. Um, so that's 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 predominantly it. And ideally, you know, because you're asking me for, you know, ICP definition, ideally what we would like to see is um, someone in revenue ops or sales ops already with a company 
having a little bit of a grip on the data and the tools. It doesn't mean that data needs to be flawless and so forth. That's that's never the issue. Um, yeah. But at least having a go-to person for us to be like, hey, you know, you need to plug in here, you need to plug in there, uh, and you need to kind of you know measure this like that. Um, that's usually uh, where you know if we have a contact like a VP of sales or CRO or something like that, where that doesn't really work out. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. And VC and non-VC uh, backed companies, so tech companies we don't care. in general, right? We don't care. So, I mean, we have we have companies that are very, very heavily VC backed, uh, burning a lot of cash, mm -hmm. and then we have profitable companies that are even public. We have like three companies that are public on like okay. you know not the not the Nasdaq in right. New York. It's the Nasdaq in Copenhagen. <laughs> so it's like it's a very very different market cap there. Um, but it's um, you know it's uh, it's serious businesses and it's it's very much you know yeah. startup businesses, right? That's a good point. Sometimes when I we hear that it's a public company, for them, this is not a yeah. client that we can serve. IPO. <laughs> <laughs> they they have exited it. Yes. <laughs> the founders are rich yeah. today. Yeah. So <laughs> so anyway, you in terms of the journey of the company, it has been uh, quite quick. So you guys started in August twenty one, as you were saying. Yeah. It's, it's been almost eighteen months after you have raised the pre seed yeah. round, the two million, as you said and the 6 million seed rounds in June of 22, but you have just decided to disclose or announce uh, that round, uh, I would say some weeks ago, right? Uh, yeah. Am I correct yeah. to, to say it? Uh, why did you guys wait uh, from summer last year to beginning of this year to, to announce that round? Yeah, so um, for the most part of those 18 months that we have been going, we basically uh, sold a spreadsheet solution, right? We kind of, the enemy that we define in the market that needs to be killed, which is, you know, BIs, BI and spreadsheet trying to solve this problem somehow, that's exactly what we used to solve the problem for for the, the most part of, uh, of last year. Um, and we basically, um, you know, with our, with our customers and, um, you know, almost design partners, uh, worked through this problem, build out the product, um, and it took us it took us much longer than we thought it would. By the way, I mean, I think that's a typical story for for everyone. I feel, um, and we basically decided, hey, we have this cool funding event, uh, which is always like a, and you know, everyone is clapping and high fiving and everything. Um, but if we go out with this in you know in June, July, first of all, it's a summer slump, so you don't want to do that. Um, right. But also, you know this message is going to gain a lot of reach. So what, what are you going to put in that message? Is it just like, Hey, I'm thanking the team and the new investors and then end of my message. Or do you want to maybe use that vehicle of reach, um, you know, both, you know, PR, but also social um, right. to, you know, to transport a different message. Uh, and basically we literally waited until we had our beta release done, which, you know, took us until end of January, early February. Um, and then we said like, hey, funding announcement, everyone was like clapping and high-fiving. And then by the way, here's the product that we built that solves X, Y, and that issue for you. Um, and basically had some meat to the bone of that, that announcement, right? So we were, um, I feel, you know, waiting. Some people were, um, I mean, we're not making a big secret either, by the way. So someone is asking, us like, no, we raised in June. Um, but, um, you know, waiting until then felt a little bit silly to be honest, because like, hey, we're sitting on this thing. Why are we doing this? Um, now that we waited and then coupled it with the with the product announcement, uh, you know, some some of my angels called it that that was like strategic PR, Tony, really well done, you know? <laughs> it's like, well, okay, you know, there you go. But we basically um, we basically decided to, to use that yeah. PR splash that we had, and you don't have too many of those, we decided that to, to use that with a specific product announcement in, in, in mind. Especially early on, again, you have 18 months of, of life. The, the good news is that the problem that you are solving is, is quite relevant, so people want to know, but still, you need some time to create the brand and reputation, also to yeah. have the resources to, to make that noise um, yeah. out there. But something that I found really amazing is that you started to sell almost since day one, uh, which yeah. is ki kind of counterintuitive about a VC packet company. Let's ensure that we have a strong MVP. 
uh, let's do a lot of content marketing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That point you did, you have a podcast and, and, and so on. Um, but you, you said, okay, let, let's not having the, the initial product ready uh, prevent us from starting testing if there is problem solution fit, if people are willing yeah. to pay, even for yeah. a crappy initial uh, product, I, I would say. But, yeah. No, the, the, and it's, and I think that time will tell whether or not that was the right approach. I think it definitely helped us raising the seed, by the way, like for sure, right? Being able to, to point to a roster of a couple of really cool logos that arguably get a really shitty, crappy solution. And still, um, because it was very manual, we basically were charging between 30 and 60,000 euros for this, right? That was kind of the entry ticket. Um, and we had like Impressive. zero to negative uh, 30, 60 K. <laughs> also that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> different, yeah. different market we know now. Uh, but, uh, but basically, I mean, we were selling this on, you know, zero negative gross margin. So actually kind of our customers are getting an okay deal to be honest. Right. Um, um, and, um, by the way, that pricing now has changed the so productizing and so forth, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to do more advertisement here. Right. Um, but basically, um, we, we, uh, we started the company actually, um, and almost on day three, we had our first customer. It was obviously working on that for a while. Right. And then kind of it worked out. Um, and it was, um, what it helped us with is, you know, by now we all know that everyone has that problem. We kind of know it. And we now know that that problem comes in many different ways because everyone invented it. The same solution on an island is like the data model, the revenue model, the, the go-to-market plan, the, uh, the plan of record and whatever your, your metrics tree or whatever. Um, but you know, for a long time, Olaf and I. So we have like a third co-founder, which is CTO, CPO, Andrew. But Olaf and I are very much com commercial kind of guys. For a long time, we were like worried that this is, and this is what we call it, uh, a toller for problem. So Tony and Olaf combined, it's a toller for problem. Only the two of us have it; no one else has it. Um, and we were basically, you know, worried that that might be true. Uh, so we basically um, decided to go out and sell and sell and sell and pressure test whether or not this is just a cool fancy idea we have that everyone theoretically should be caring about or if people actually cared about it enough to pay us a bunch of money and at the same time get kind of a uh, you know a scrappy solution plus by the way uh, you know some services and consulting from Olaf and myself right and both of us have like a heavy CRO CEO background so and I think that uh, honestly helped us you know swing some deals in our favor um especially in the early days uh, but also that added surface then gave us lots of more learnings, right? We could sit with them, help them on some issues, but also explore, you know, what, what issues there might be, you know, below the surface, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, I think this was this was great for the seed, a thousand percent. And it was great to have some revenue pressure from the early start of this whole thing. Um, uh, but it also, you know, you then need to have a little bit of a team to service that, that comes some headaches with that, you know, some hires didn't work out and so forth. Um, right. and, uh, th th it's, there's some cost to it beyond just the financial burden of it. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the way we decided to go. And you, you were already kind of getting there, but, uh, the way you have formed your founding team. So you have kind of a CPO and the CTO, uh, yeah. So we have, um, uh, so we're three, um, yeah. Olaf and myself, we're the, the commercial folks around it. So here's a COO background. Both of us have RevOps background and I have kind of the CRO background. Um, mm -hmm. And we basically agreed that we see this problem from this perspective all the time. Um, and then, you know, once we, once we locked in on this, on this thing, we then were realizing, I mean, we, we knew it before, but it became more clear that we needed someone to build this thing. You know, uh, we could maybe build a, we could, we could probably build a consultancy with this and we right. almost proven we can do it. Uh, but we you know, my, my saying went, uh, we're way too lazy to be consultants. Uh, so we had to have a product <laughs> here <laughs> and, uh, well and, done. um, and then we added, uh, then we added Andrew to the team. And the, I mean, we all know each other from back from Falcon. So we were all working at the same time at Falcons. So we had okay. a really good relationship already there. We, uh, we also had, you know, quarterly staked in as the three of us kind of boys night out and we're always like, Hey, we should be doing something at some point. Um, right. and obviously at that point it was, you know, just, you know, joking around and, and suddenly it was uh, very real. 
It's like, so Andrew, we're doing this thing now. Are you, are you, are you game or not? You know, and uh, <laughs> and you know, happily and luckily he was, and uh, and that's um, that's when you know he joined and started building out the the development team and uh, making sure that we're actually getting to this thing that we that we wanted to build. And what is the air count today, uh, Tony? So we're very heavy. You know, I'm just gonna preface that. Uh, <laughs> so we're like 30, 33 people, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for pre a million um, in ARR, that's a lot. Yes. I think though the, and I'm just justifying justifying this here myself. You know, I'm, I just need to work through it myself, Mike. That's actually what all of this is about. Um, <laughs> But, but I mean, but this we have... is great because the ones who are listening might be asking themselves the same, and and, and yeah. ask also asking themselves, should I have more people, less people, based on what? So that, that's great that you are justifying why yeah. have you so, decided to go in this direction, man? No, so I mean, the the seed was kind of outsized with six million, um, uh, at least for current standards. Um, in, in the past, would be much more a series, I right? Uh, so that's my point, actually. So really. Yeah. You know, the, the benchmark almost should be uh, more towards saying like, hey, we're kind of a series A-ish company, even without yeah. the uh, the revenue behind it. Um, I think one of the one of the core pieces is that um, it's quite a difficult thing that we're building here, at least on the on the um, you know product side. Um, and um, maybe it's I don't know bad execution on our side that it took so long. Maybe it's just a really difficult problem that takes a little bit longer to kind of get to something that is. But MVP or sellable. So um, I think that that basically kind of also has prohibited us from, you know, going out more proactively and selling that stuff. Um, but uh, then you also have, you know, we have a small uh, CS team component that basically kind of handles some of the customer relationships that we have, mm-hmm. you know, already acquired. Um, so generally out of the 30, we have 20 in product. Uh, so this includes development and design and, right. you know, data. Um, and then we have like... Um, uh, you know, a small handful um, on the on the customer delivery side. That's how we're calling it. And then two, three marketing folks and the founders, basically. And then you're then you're kind of there. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I still think it's heavy, but it's also a really great setup to move really fast in the in that direction. And and to be it's honest, the funding issue. enables us the the funding enables us to you know to splurge like that, right? Yeah. And the good news is that you validated well the the problem solution fit uh, before yeah. hiring those those people. I think that it's much more dangerous when you you don't know if this is really a strong pain for the yeah. customer. If the customer is willing to pay for something to solve that problem and start hiring uh, like crazy. Yeah. In this this sense, I think that what you, what you are feeling is we need to have a much better product and we need to get there fast because we already have people in the line that want to buy this. So this is yeah. a no-brainer. The revenue is waiting for uh, a better product to be able to, yeah. to, to, um, to go faster, right? So the, And that's the point. We should use the, the VC money to be able uh, not to survive, but to be able to grow uh, faster than what what it would be in a bootstrapping uh, fashion, right? No, absolutely. But it, I, I got to tell you, it, it does feel nerve wracking to see you know the money pouring out of the bank account every month. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'd, love, we'd love to have a burn rate that would allow you to have an even more comfortable runaway, yeah. <laughs> even if yeah. the Series A will be coming and and the metrics will be there to to raise that round. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, but it's, I, th- I think I think it's terrifying, though, right? I mean, it's really the, um, and I, I'm I'm sure many you know on this on this podcast can kind of uh, or resonate with this, but it it does feel like you need to, you know, you see the cliff coming, you see the wall approaching, yeah. But the way to go about it in some in some cases is to speed up, you know, <laughs> to crazy. go faster towards the cliff, and I think that's um. Uh, that's that's a very uh, reckless and uncomfortable feeling I sometimes feel. But it, you know, obviously, yeah. kind of you rationalize yourself into it, and then it's like, hey, you know, this is yeah. how this should be done, and blah blah. And let's hope everything goes great. Um, but uh, but it but it does it does create some sleep nights. But I guess that's that's the that's the game we're playing yeah. in this sense. 
and again the emotional roller coaster and uh, yeah. the bipolar syndrome right so in yeah. the first <laughs> six months or 12 uh, months after the run let's let's go 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 and then the metrics are not coming wait we need to find out a bridge, <laughs> extend the runaway, make our decisions. <laughs> so it seems that we are, that we are kind of crazy, and uh, yes. of course, as responsible leaders and fair leaders, it it, it creates uh, a lot of pain uh, in yeah. ourselves. And that I, I feel that you and that, that's a good comment to introduce kind of a, an interesting topic, which is moving from revenue leader to CEOs as revenue mm -hmm. leader. You have access to those numbers. You understand. It depends how, on how transparent the CEO, CFO, and, and the rest of the members of the ship team are with you. But in general, the CRO is, is someone who is good with numbers. Yeah. Um, so usually the CRO understands the movie that is going on. Uh, other leaders in the leadership team might have a little bit more in our time. And usually there is this uh, huge, uh, let's say, um, discussions between the CRO, the CFO and the CEO and mm. the rest are trying to, you know, to help help them out to, to make it yeah. work, right? Uh, but how, how has been kind of the, the, the shift from being in the, in the CRO seat for the two last uh, times and, and uh, you, your two last experiences that you have been yeah. able to exit to now really being the captain of the ship? Yeah. So um, I think, I mean, the, the, the obvious piece is um, product, right? Suddenly, suddenly there's responsibility also for product, right? Kind of that's kind of on a, on a functional level and um, learning and, 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 and working yourself into that realm. Obviously, that takes some time and it takes some experience and also takes some trust, right? Because I know that I don't have so much of a clue about this. So relying obviously on the co-founder is super important, right? Um, right. I think the um I think on a functional level, kind of if we stay there, um, I think another piece is really around um the uh the, the focus actually on marketing. So if you if mm -hmm. you are a CRO of 15 million, 20 million, uh, I would even argue even 10 million and up, a lot of a lot of these pieces are kind of in place, right? Kind of positioning, messaging, you're yeah. kind of burned into the G2 competitor grids, you know who you're playing against and and it becomes uh, optimizing maneuvering. Um, but when you, uh, so in that point as a CRO, you're not, you're not questioning messaging every day. You're not questioning H1, H2. You don't even know what those two terms mean necessarily, right? Yeah. Um, you have a marketing team that, you know, thinks about that. But super early on, especially with no product there was um well how do we how do we get out there and how do we talk about this and how do we tell this story and um uh, i'm not so super great with words um but having having now done like a year of content on linkedin and podcasts and a couple of other con uh, formats um helped me and the, the the small two two people marketing team we have to get smarter around how we want to actually talk about this whole thing um and how we're going to get it out of this theoretical world of, you know, revenue modeling to know it actually, what we do is we help you to do flawless GTM execution, right? Um, and kind of making that, making that leap right. and, uh, and using the right words. And, you know, so for example, right now we have like an issue um, that sometimes we get pointed towards the CFO because we use the wrong words, kind of revenue planning and say, oh, that's for me, the CFO. And then the CFO looks at it and it's like, oh, that looks like <laughs> FP and A. And let's buy some FP&A tool instead. Uh, basically kind of really thinking, you know, what are the words we're choosing even the sales process to not land right. at the undesirable outcome, but land with a CRO or something like that. Um, so that that was, a, that was a biggie for me, actually. And I think then the last thing is really about the, um, you know, really thoughtfulness of, of the culture that you want to have here, right? And the mm -hmm. and I think uh, since Andrew Olaf and I we know each other for a long time, so there's there's very much alignment on values already there um, between the three of us, and that obviously, you know, at the end of the day, that helps a lot with setting up a culture that then also aligns with those values. Um, 
we like in any friendship, you don't you don't have a check in and say, so my values are those five. What are your five values? And then you compare. Yeah, it's like it doesn't work like that, right? We, but, we can uh, be friends now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but to a degree, when you when you then build a company together, you kind of need to start uh, codifying what those values are, right? Um, and uh, um, simply to create a little bit of a framework of, you know, how everyone should be approaching this thing, basically, right? And it's really incomplete and difficult to do um and uh, uh and having obviously kind of this this culture this value set then we also then uh forced ourselves and the three of us are all like more technical than we are you know great with words i would say um mm -hmm. we all forced ourselves and okay now we have those abstract things of of five values here let's let's you know transport those into do's and don'ts so we didn't we didn't call it like this, but I think virtues we call it. Basically, what is good behavior and what behavior do we not want to see? Uh, to make it just more tangible, right? Because yeah, otherwise you end up with like honesty and transparency and you know those 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 Enron mm -hmm. uh, you know values. Um, but but it's really difficult for people to interpret what does that actually mean, right? Uh, and so right. we force ourselves to to be more intentional around that actually. Love it, and you have. Two very interesting nuggets to kind of approach uh, two of those five uh, values that you were talking about. Uh, do you want to talk more about it to, to give a, yes. a, an example I mean, on that? So, list? so we have like five different ones. I don't gonna not gonna go through through all of them. So, but one one standout for me is um, we're calling it, we are all grown ups. Yeah. Um, so number one that is true. Uh, because um, we're all a little bit older now, <laughs> most of us. <laughs> but but it comes with us having literally. kids, or <laughs> yes, literally um, in the last eighteen months, basically. You know. But uh, you know, most of us have kids. Most of us have other things. Um, and um, uh, and you know, it's not our first rodeo. We've seen this before. We've seen the craziness before. We've seen the ambition before, yeah. and you know that faltering. Um, but basically, the the reason why we chose something like this is. Um, we we you know simply because of you know cognitive load otherwise we want to we want to run a pretty transparent organization um you know with its limitations we're not going to share everyone's salaries we're not going to share the, the bank account details or something like that uh, but we want to be pretty transparent but if you are transparent um you cannot only share the good news so you will have to share bad news as well and and you will always have bad news there will always be like a you know competitor getting funding or a customer leaving or a cherished employee leaving um and you you know at the point of you disclosing bad news it actually is then in the responsibility of the receiver of that bad news to handle that in a, in a good way right um if something bad happens with someone that is you know let's just say immature uh you know suddenly panic sets in and people run around and oh fuck, do i need to find another job and you know what's going on and um Everything and, that we're talking about during this show, right? Yes, everything, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, if that is the result, you almost can't be transparent. So basically what we said from the beginning, hey, we want to have grown-ups here. We want to have people that are able to deal with, you know, when the sun is shining and when it's raining. And that's okay, yeah. you know, and we're not going to hide some of the bad stuff. Um, but that means that, you know, when we have bad stuff to share that that you guys just need to, you need to deal with this in the right way, right? So that's kind of going about it as, um, you know, you need to be be grown ups in that sense, right? Um, yeah. And the the other piece is, um, so again, we're in Denmark. Uh, again, we all have kids. <laughs> Most of us have kids. Um, when when so we have a different setup now. But when you when you when you pick up kids from daycare around three p.m. in Denmark, your kid is probably among the two or three last ones there. You know, just just, just for context. everyone to kind of <laughs> check in on that. <laughs> and um, at, at three p.m., so, you, yeah, you 3 already PM. are a little bit late. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you're basically late. Um, and um, and um, kind of the 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 value that we have. Um, and this was just one example, but the value you have is work isn't everything. Um, and the the idea behind it is is also very rational, if you will, right? You. You're gonna stay in this job for maybe two or three years, hopefully longer. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna stay in this particular part of your career, maybe for seven to ten years, in you know that specific role or 
or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you're going to stay with your own body, uh, with your hopefully, you know, partner uh, and with your kids for the next, what, 50 years. Um, Love and it becomes pretty clear, you know, what you should be optimizing for, right? You shouldn't be screwing up your own body and your health and your family uh, for something that you're only going to be in for two to three years. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that everyone, you know, just, you know, checks in at nine and leaves at two and kind of is all relaxed. We have, you know, we have people working late. We have people sometimes working right. the weekends and so forth. Um, but it's um, it's important for us that... Um, that we have an agreement that um, that this is just part of the journey. The other side of everyone's you know own journey is equally, if not more, important actually. Um, and uh, and I live that, so I'm you know too too much too much degree as I can. Um, and and so do so do the other co-founders. And we encourage everyone to do the same. And obviously the 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 idea is to have happier, uh, healthier. Uh, more stable, less stressed employees, um, uh, while still we maintaining a, a pretty strong work ethic around it, right? So that's 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 how we, and let's see if this is the solution to it. By the way, but but that's that's right. how we try to approach it. So it's really great that you have shared specific examples and uh, that you said something that is really important: it's that the founders are living those values. Yeah. Uh, because if not, it would be you guys leave those values. We are the founders. We need to live <laughs> another way, <laughs> and then you are yeah. also killing yourself, right? So, uh, I, I think I think it doesn't work. I think it's okay though for the founders to have a little bit of a special kind of treatment to this, right? Um, I think it is okay. It's this company is a little bit more our baby than it is someone else's baby, right? So I, that's I think okay. I think it's okay. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna go on, you know, a, another couple of weeks of paternity tomorrow. Actually, uh, that's what kind of we squeezed this in today. Um, uh, one of my co-founders is gonna have his third child any moment now. Could be now, you know, I'm 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 on D and D right now, but you know, it could have texted me that it's going on right now. So I mean, we're we're, we're trying to um, uh, we're also trying to manage our own lives and uh, and families in, in the best way possible, right? Yeah. Amazing. So let's go to, to the last segment of the show where we do hear a ping pong of question and answers. Uh, if you would have the opportunity to meet yourself uh, at for a coffee at the beginning of Roblox, I know it has been only 18 months ago, <laughs> so usually it works better when it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, no, I know. But I know that this is... this last 18 months have been so intense for you and for any founder that I'm sure that you already would have a coffee with interesting nuggets for your younger self. Yeah. I think I'll probably tell myself to, um, uh, to focus more and more and more on product actually earlier. I think because of some of the selling kind of, we were, we were going a little, my, at least my mind space. Yeah. Sorry. was a bit more taken up by some of that work versus the other. Um, and again, right? You can still, you know, maybe was it the right thing or not? Um, but a lot more focus on on product. I think it could have. I mean, you don't know, but maybe it could have given us another two or three months earlier or something like that, right? So let's let's you know let's see about that. Um, and then the other thing, um, I think, um, I think the and you started calling it the bipolarism or the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, theoretically, I knew this before as well, right? Sure, you know, you'll yeah. have good days and bad days. Um, but what I'm taken aback by is the, um, I mean, it's literally one day depression and the next day is like, a, you know, you're feeling sky high or something like that. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how big the fluctuations are. And, yeah. you know, as time goes by, I think those fluctuations hopefully kind of will, will, uh, you know, the, the highs will be lower and the lows, you know, will be kind of muted a bit. Um, but knowing that this is what's going to ensue, I think um, uh, that could have, uh, could at least make me feel a little bit better. Um, yeah. And and also, you know, not finding out a year and a half into it that, oh no, everyone is having that. It's not just a you problem, Tony. Everyone is having that exact experience. Right. And I think that that would have been good one and a half years ago. Yeah, and I would strongly recommend for the ones who are listening, to take it serious because definitely as founders we are much more exposed to mental health issues and we know the impact that a mental health issue will have in the well-being of everyone around us and in the company results so 
I would, if I would be in, in that position as a CEO of a C Packard company, I would hire definitely a therapist. I have one not being there. I would have maybe two if I was in, <laughs> in, in that. But I would need to upgrade <laughs> my, 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 uh, my, my therapist bills uh, to be able, but again, <laughs> The VC bucket money needs also to be used yes. in, in, in that way. And I think that that's a good allocation of, of the investment because it, it really prevents your well-being. And uh, as you said, we are much more exposed because the eyes are so high or and, yeah. and the and the lows are so are so low. What are you yeah. the most proud of on your journey so far? Sorry. Um it, it always sounds it always sounds like such a cliche. Um but I'm extremely proud of the people that we were able to hire. Like seriously, um, yeah. some really, really senior folks, like former VPs of crazy companies, and uh, joining us for usually a little bit less in cash. And sure, there's an equity component now. Um, yeah. But that that those folks, you know, decided to take the leap and go into something like that. That's uh, it. Still baffles me how we were able to uh, woo them over. Um, and it's it's such a night and day thing to have a complete professional in the seat that that knows how some of these kind of wor things work and be able to rely on that um, mm -hmm. versus and you know this is you know another thing that and I think that's not new for me in the last you know 12, 18 months but um, you know and early in my career it's like hey let's have some you know young folks that are cheaper but they're gonna work later and you know they're gonna you know push through. Um, now it's, uh, I want to only hire, I want to hire the best people I can afford for, for everything I have. Um, and, um, uh, and, and us having been able to, uh, you know, hire some of those great folks was actually, um, pretty amazing. That's amazing. I, I see that trend more and more and more. I, I think that people really understand that speed is a, a currency of the game and you need to have people who have done this before so you can speed yeah. up. And even with that, we know how challenging it is because we have just been admitting that we have seen the movie several times and now it is yeah. difficult to make it work, even having seen the, the movie uh, several yeah. times. And at the same time, of course, we need also to be open to give the opportunity to the new ones because we had someone that gave us that opportunity to ourselves. And, and we know that sometimes ignorance is also good, right? Because I, I, I yeah. knew if I knew what I know today, when I started Scale Up Valley, maybe I've, I've never ever, <laughs> ever started it. So uh, good that I was a bit ignorant uh, at the time. Yeah. And I'm still ignorant in a lot of uh, areas. No, and, and that's why my, it's great. <laughs> my, my co so Olaf and I, super early on, uh, uh, we were like, um, you need to either be stupid or a little bit crazy. For, for doing this. And I, th and I think it's true. And I think it's, it's very true. It's very irrational to do something like that. And, and that's okay. You just need to lean into, into the craziness. Goodness to the craziness. <laughs> yes. <Goodness to> you. <laughs> Worst <laughs> advice ever received. It. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't keep track of those. <laughs> great, I, don't, great I, don't, one. I don't i don't keep track of those actually um yeah. there's tons of that to be honest right i think the the yeah. difficulty is the difficulty is uh, not yeah. receiving feedback it's it's filtering out what what you shouldn't be listening to right and i think um so i don't i don't have a great i don't have a great idea actually on uh on what the worst uh, worst feedback was this uh, is sorry, important worst to... advice Again, for the ones listening, yeah, uh, don't be arrogant and take a listen to what is said, but don't stay too too much time on what is said also because you need to be clear on, on your priorities. And sometimes those are not your priorities. Just mm. let them out and, and also don't take it personal, right? Because sometimes people that share those with you are really trying to help you out. But if you take it too serious, uh, it is hurting you. And and they, that's I mean, also the, not the intention of the ones who share it. No, exactly. And it's also it's also funny, right? Especially if it's feedback from like prospects or customers. Um, it's almost always this cognitive okay. dissonance you kind of need to go through. And it's like, well, um, you don't fully understand it yet. And I made a mistake in communicating or you're not the right persona or so forth, right? But in many cases, or in some cases, it's also like, no, your product just sucks, right? And 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 figuring out what to listen to and what not exactly. to really, really difficult. Fully agreed. 
And finally, the, the resources, uh, favorite book, business or non-business, you decide. Um, uh, so I am currently reading and, you know, it will, I'm not sure if it's going to be the favorite, but it's kind of pretty high up, uh, pretty currently reading, uh, uh, change, change your mind or changing minds. Um, it's pretty interesting, uh, talking about, um, the signs of persuasion actually. Uh, and you know, they obviously taking it very much in a politics kind of angle because that's and religion because that's the hot button issues yep. but the more i'm listening to it i'm thinking about hey this is how sales works this is how marketing works this is how leadership yep. works right is a, a couple of really really kind of great pieces um uh that's kind of on the uh on on the book side um, and then sorry what was the other one and favorite movie or series no i i'm i, I, don't, I don't think I, i don't think i have a favorite for this it's um um no i mean i'm currently i'm currently enjoying you know i'm very recently recently biased i very much uh, currently enjoy uh this uh, formula one thing kind of race drive drive to survive or something like that on netflix okay. it's fantastic it's it's this typical hey we're hey we're shooting a documentary but no you're totally shooting a drama and it's like it's it's really fantastic i really love it Awesome. And finally, your favorite podcast, excluding yours and this one. <laughs> um, so I've I've listened, I don't listen to many podcasts, by the way. Um, but I've listened a lot to um um the um uh what was it called? Um the uh masters of scale, sorry. Uh yeah, masters of scale. Yep. Yeah. Very much, very exactly, freedom. Very much, kind of a, a staple, I think, by now. But obviously, the people that he has on there is pretty insane. Um, yeah. And you know, listen, you know, being able to listen to their thoughts is pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty mind mind moving sometimes, right? When you kind of hear, even Mark Zuckerberg before kind of it fell off the cliff. If you have him talk about some of that stuff, it's pretty like. <laughs> first of all, first of all, you realize, wow. He's and this is a German saying. I'm from Germany originally. Uh, he's also only cooking with water, right? That's basically kind of as a thing in Germany. We say like, you can be rich, you can be poor, you can be super intelligent. At the end of the day, using the right. same tools to do the same stuff. Um, but then the also toilets. kind of the the <laughs> the perspectives that they then sometimes take is like, oh shit, I never yeah. saw the world like this, and they're totally right about this. So I think that's um, that's pretty uh, mind blowing sometimes. Definitely a great inspiration for for us in 2018 to start this this podcast, and we wanted to be the masters of skill, the of the ones who are building it, not yes. the ones who are already yes. uh, super successful. And that's why we are doing what we do, and we know that sometime Tony will be on that masters of skill and will be super happy there you go. to to yeah. listen to the episode there. <laughs> Tony, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Thank you, and man. you are always invited to come back because I can see that you will you will be building, keep building a great story ahead. And uh, what a great start. Congrats for the previous Thanks. 18 months and all the best for, for the upcoming 18 months, at least. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, Mike. Really nice to meet you and have a good one. Likewise, and to our community, thanks Bye. for being there. We keep here bringing you the best of the best to make your life a little bit easier as you scale up your company. See you soon and keep scaling.